Welcome to a breath of fresh air with Sandy Kay. Because it's a beautiful day. Mm-hmm. A breath of fresh air. Beautiful day. Oh, baby, any day that you're gone away. It's a beautiful day. Hello, and thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I love having your company, and it makes me so happy to get messages from you telling me you're enjoying the show. Before we get into it, just a shout out to all of you who've requested artists that you'd like to hear interviewed. I have them all in hand and promise to roll out as many as I can in the coming weeks and months. Now, on to our very special guest this week. I'm pretty confident that if you're listening to A Breath of Fresh Air, you probably know and love Creedence Clearwater Revival. I'm sure many of you lived and breathed them back in the day, just like I did. Remember their sensational album, Cosmos Factory? Well, CCR comprised singer-songwriter and guitarist John Fogarty, his brother Tom Fogarty, bassist Stu Cook and drummer Doug Cosmo Clifford, after whom that album was named. In just three years, the guys had 14 top 10 hits and they performed at Woodstock ahead of their acrimonious breakup in 1972. I'm super excited to have Doug Cosmo Clifford with me today. What a treat to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. There is so much to talk to you about. I'll call you Cosmo because that's what you like to be called. Everyone calls you Cosmo, right? Uh, All my friends do, that's for sure. Well, I'm going to call you Cosmo too then. Yeah. You've got a new album out. There's a documentary on Netflix. And, of course, there's a book out about Creedence Clearwater Revival. Well, you probably were busier in your day, but you're pretty busy these days too, right? I'm pretty busy. I've got my own record label now and i've got a, a, a distributorship uh, from sony so i've got uh, all the 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 tools that i need for that side of the the coin the label won't be p- bossing me around that's for sure <laughs> and and uh, in my 60 years of being under contract as a musician it'll be the first time in 60 years that i won't have to audit my record company wow I'm not going to sue myself quite yet. (laughs) Let's start with the new record. It's called California Gold. You actually recorded it back in 1978, and you recorded it at the time with Bobby Whitlock, who we all know well from Derek and the Dominoes, right? Right, that's correct. that we never saw it at that time. <laughs> well, I have a, a little uh, vault, in fact, it's called Cosmos Vault, and I have uh, a lot of uh, great musical projects that didn't come to fruition back when, so better late than never, they sound as good as they did, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So I'm, I'm uh, taking this project now with Bobby singing. I think he's the best he's ever sung. I made him stop smoking cigarettes Did you? With, <laughs> with me, and, and I made him. Uh, then I, I got him on a running program. So because I'm an athlete, I'm always getting you know, in shape and uh, running around. So uh, his instrument is, is, is his throat, and wind is, is critical. And I knew he could do more, 
uh, anybody could if they got rid of the cigarettes and, and they, they did and they actually started liking to run. <laughs> really? So are you talking about recently this has happened or back in 1978 when you reconfigured yeah. Bobby Whitlock? Yeah, many moons ago. Right. Back, uh, so you you day. set him you set him on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And he was glad I did. I bet he was. I guess he, he could owe you the fact that he's around and healthy today and he's still doing some fabulous things. Your bottom blues, you made me cry. I don't want to lose this feeling. If I could choose a place to die. record first came out where were you at when you pulled Bobby Whitlock and Donald Dunn into it well it was back in uh, 1978 Prince had broken up uh, in 72 and I had uh, a few little recording projects and things of that nature and I finally decided I wanted to put a band together and and uh, get back into a full-time uh, musical project and so I was at Donald Duck Dunn's house and uh, and I, I told him that I wanted to start a band and that does he and did he know any singers of merit that might want to work with me and he says yeah uh, Bobby Whitlock and I said no, that rings a bell and he says Derek and the Dominoes Layla all that and I said oh of course so anyway I said yeah well why don't you uh, get a hold of him and see if he would mind or like to put a project together where we would be the primary writers you know get get back into playing some gigs and and recording and, and the whole thing and so he said i'll do that he did and bobby said yeah he would love to so bobby drove up to my house from from la he was broke I had a pregnant wife and a three three-year-old daughter and uh, he had an old 57 Chevy, which was kind of a cool car in those days, but it wasn't, it wasn't in, in the best of shape. But anyway, he rolls up and in he came and we started talking and we just got right into the nuts and bolts of what we wanted to do. And the next thing you know, I got a pad and a pencil out and we're writing songs just like just like that. And, and it felt good. And I like to co-write. Uh, but uh, if I co-write, I, I co-write with one other person only. I won't go uh, three or and up because it, it, it becomes too many cooks and people start uh, thinking about their percentage instead of thinking about creating a music. We got that out of the way. There was just the two of us. And, uh, and so we actually started writing songs right there in my uh, living room. And it was a very easy comfortable uh, no nobody was worried about producing more or less than the other guy the the mission was completed that way and i would say it was a definite 50 50 but i was more on the lyrics side he was more on the music side and, and uh, Wahoo! We got ended up. Uh, well, the, the 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 thing that you you do is if you have songs and ideas, you got to record them. Otherwise, you'll forget what to, what you're doing. I trust me. That two in the morning, where I had a, a couple of glasses of wine, I wake up. I've got this great idea, and I better pee first. This might be a long time. <laughs> and, and then it's gone. When I was done peeing, I went back to bed. And, and it was gone in the morning. Not not the pee, of course. <laughs> no. Oh, it's, I'm glad to hear you have to do that too. <laughs> we, we all do that, don't we?
10 track collection and each song seems better than the next really. It's kind of a combination of Delaney and Bonnie, which Bobby Whitlock had been with in the past. It does sound like Credence as well, doesn't it? Well, that's a nice mixture of the two, I think. And uh, Duck, having Duck on bass, uh, he's on half the songs because he had to leave the project in the middle of it because he, uh, John Belushi asked him to be one of the Blues Brothers. Duck said, so "This I, I, I got to go. This is my, my dream come true. And we said, and we all wish you well. Good for you. And uh, we were very happy for him, and he did great. The little leprechaun. Um, you know, I loved working with Duck and uh, looked forward to being in a band with him. And, and then uh, Bobby's wife uh, didn't like the Bay Area so much, and... Next thing you know, we, we said, well, someday maybe we'll, we'll get it together, but right now is not the, not the time. Donald Duck Dunn, for anybody who doesn't know, had been the bass player with Booker T and the MGs for a long while, hadn't he? Yes, and I'll bet you uh, not everybody realizes that Booker T and the MGs was the house band for Stax Records. So when you hear Otis Redding's uh, record, the band behind Otis Redding is Booker T and the MGs. Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting when the evening comes Watching the ships roll in And I'll watch them roll away again I'm just sitting on the dock of the bay Watching the tide roll away Sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. I left my home in Georgia and I headed for the Frisco Bay. Cause I've got nothing to live for. Look like nothing's gonna come my way. So I'm just gonna sit on the dock of the Watching the tide roll away And sitting on the dock of a bay Wasting time They were uh, producers and uh, wrote the songs with the, with the different uh, singers, Sam and Dave, on and on and on and on, the list goes on. But Booker T and the MG, they were Stax Records. Ah, you've got huge pedigree between the three of you. And I guess it's no wonder that this album sounds so fantastic. Do you have a track on it that's closest to your heart? Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, the good news is there's a difference between them, and and, and that's that, that's a good thing. You're not re repetitive uh, with with your writing or your execution of, of the material. So I would have to say uh, I really like uh, Darkest for the Dawn. Uh, th that I think is the best uh, overall in terms of writing, uh, but it's not. I'm not saying it's necessarily a single, but uh, I think it was the best, uh, especially now uh, with the, what's going on in the world. Uh, it's a it's a scary kind of a scary uh, good luck song. Does it surprise you that these songs that you wrote 
more than 50 years ago are still so appropriate today? You know, it, not anymore. I, I used to, it used to blow my mind. But then when you think about it, art Im imitates uh, life and life imitates art. So life is cyclical. And uh, we're in that area of the, the circle where it's pretty rough out there. Yeah. And everything old is new again, which we can see with the music. It's very hip to be producing 70s type sounds now, isn't it? Well, I sure is. 70s were, were real good to me. So music is up for me has always been medicine. from Doug Cosmo Clifford's latest album, California Gold. Don't go anywhere. We're about to talk all things Creedence Clearwater Revival, and I know you're going to want to hear what Cosmo has to say. This is a breath of fresh air with Sandy Kay. It's a beautiful day. Thanks for being here. I'm chatting with Creedence Clearwater Revival's drummer, Doug Cosmo Clifford. CCR's history is pretty bittersweet, even tragic in some ways, but as you'll hear, it's also a story of triumph. You'd been playing together since, what, about 1958, and you were all school friends apart from Tom, who was a few years older. Right. Well, you know, who knows what the tide will bring, you know. We were on a quite a, a treadmill. We were always recording, bridging and the gap between albums with singles in the middle. Nobody did that back then. They said, you're wasting a single. It should be there to sell the album. Well, the way it worked, uh, we had these singles in the middle and then al albums that were singles was loaded. So uh, the, the ones in the middle did very well with the ones that were surrounding them. So we were always recording, always rehearsing, uh, and always touring. people realised that you'd been playing as a band for probably around 10 years before you broke through and had that first massive hit. It was exactly 10 years and at that time Tom was the singer. It, it was Tom who brought us in, uh, in to the studio. Uh, he had a band uh, and they were prototypical musicians. Tom had a vision of recording a couple songs, going to LA, Hollywood, whatever, uh, where the record companies were and to take the demo in and try and get a record deal for him and his band. Well, his band said, are we getting paid? He said, no, it's costing me a fortune um, and my time. And they said, are there going to be any chicks there? No. 
we're going to, uh, it's going to be a re recording session. And they said, we'd rather work on our cars. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> In come the Blue Velvets, uh, instrumental trio, John, right. you and myself. And he came to us and asked if we'd back him up. And we said, make a record. And he said, yes. We said, yeah, of course we'd want to go. Are you kidding me? And that's how it all started. Uh, Tom was the guy that made it uh, possible uh, with uh, being able to finance a project. And, uh, and also, uh, we were able to start recording early with the mindset that, you know, the, the way you make it is in this business to have a single on the radio. And so our dream was to have our songs played on the radio. Well, they've been playing them for 54 years. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Absolutely. Which was the first that got played? And what was your reaction when you heard it on the radio? Well, we uh, were, were uh, a band called the Gollywogs for a while. Uh, we didn't give ourselves that stupid name. Uh, the owner of this record company did, but that's another story. Uh, we had a song called Brown Eyed Girl, but, and it wasn't Van Morrison's Brown Eyed Girl. It was ours. And it went, got to number one in uh, re regions in the Bay Area where we lived. Down south, San Jose was number one. Uh, and up in Sacramento, north of, the, of that, was it was number one. It was number one in a couple of other, other markets and, and enough to get us some money. And what we did with the money was we didn't buy a car or work on our cars. We bought instruments, so we were able to get uh, new instruments by virtue of having a, a record being played on the radio. played on the radio was great and I was going to San Jose State University at that time Stu and I both what were you studying music uh -huh. <laughs> so you were always destined to be a musician I got into history for a while and, and, and it, it, it was the same subject because history repeats itself so anyway boom boxes were big back then and uh, in between classes at any anyway you couldn't play them in class and uh, this guy had his boombox going, and I, I hear our song being played, you know. I came up to him. I said, that's my band. That's me playing drums. He says, it is not. I said, that's my band, and that's me playing drums. And he, F you. <laughs> and, told, he, and I went, God, that's no fun. We get a hit, and, and, and nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the name change come about, Cosmo? Well, it came about because we had to get rid of that silly gollywog name, and so we came up with another silly name in triplicate, uh, Credence Clearwater Revival. Uh, Tom had a friend uh, named Credence Newball from South Africa, and uh, we thought maybe we would call it Credence Newball, and then we go, well, he'll watch <laughs> the action for, for just uh, having his name on it. We don't want to do that. So, but Credence stuck in there and we added an extra E just because if you had a lot of letters in your name, it was in boldface type in the newspaper and really stood out. So there was a method to our madness. Right. Uh, uh, Clearwater was a, a beer uh, back then and Americans don't know how to make beer. They didn't know how then and they don't know how now. <laughs> Same with coffee. I could, I could go for a nice lager, an uh, Australian lager. Come on down. <laughs> We'd love to see you here. <laughs> I, 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 let me finish or I'll, or I'll forget. Yeah, go for it. Uh, revival was a revival of ourselves. No more silly uniforms. No more silly names. Well, we got a silly name, but it's a cool silly name. It's, it's not woggish. And uh, that's that's how we did it.
It was 1969 when Proud Mary hit the airwaves and that was the same year of the Woodstock Festival, wasn't it, where you absolutely blew them away? Well, uh, y yes and no. The interesting thing to me about it, and there, here's your study in history, that all the big bands, you know, that, well, let me go back a little bit further. The fellows that were going to put the show on had a, a concept, like a brand, but it hadn't been successful yet. They hadn't done it. But the idea uh, intrigued us and what they lacked in, in experience, they didn't in enthusiasm. And all the other big, big bands were sitting around waiting for somebody to jump. And at that time, we were number one in the world in record sales and number one in the world in concert draw. So we were number one in the world. And when we said yes, all these guys. Uh -huh. Now, here's the interesting part. What happens if Creedence says no way? Would there have been a Woodstock? That I certainly didn't know. And I didn't know that you were number one at that time. Yeah, yeah, we, we were number one. you'd recorded nine of the top ten hits and performed them at Woodstock. Yes. It must have been an incredible time for you. Did you get swept away with all the, the fame and fortune? Not really. We were too busy. <laughs> we were straight and sober when we were doing business and that it, it didn't have to be a concert or just anything that we were together doing business on. If we hadn't been uh, that way, we never would have been able to handle the workload. I was intrigued to find out that you were all super straight and that the worst thing you ever did was a beer and a bit of marijuana. How come you didn't get pulled into the whole 60s peace, love and drugs movement? Well, we were all married for one and uh, had kids. And our mission was to make the best records we could. And we saw the other bands in, in town, the Grateful Dead and and bands like that, they were so high that they weren't even in tune. And they were giving each other five coming off the stage saying, wow, we've never sounded better. We've never played better. And we're looking at that. So we made a pact at the Fillmore West at that time. This was before we had hits. The music will get us high. No beer, no wine, no, no alcohol, nothing else. And we did that. Oh, a little, a little weed now and then after a show. So maybe Stewie and I might sneak out and have a pup, a puff. But it was it. amazing. So I mean, the whole audience would have been off their faces, and you guys were were all strapped. Yeah, making great music. We were high playing the music.
is a uh, documentary out on, on on Credence now, live at Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, I know. It. It's trip. fabulous. It was a, a big deal because we were playing in the Beatles' house. We wanted to be number one, and we had a little bit in, in the States, but we didn't even have to fight for it. And I want, really wanted to shine in the Beatles' house. Well, you did it. You were number one in the world. They'd broken up, and, and the timing was perfect. What goes through your mind when you look at that documentary now, when you watch yourself play in uh, Albert Hall? Yeah, I'm 160 pounds. You know, I, <laughs> You weren't an athlete then. I was playing like, a, you know, was 300 pounds. I was just beating the living crap out of those drums. And that's that's how I played then, because I could. <laughs> and uh, I've retired from, from touring now. And, but to get the power that I had then, it was a, a totally a different shift. I used martial arts techniques on, with my wrist to get that power, because I was a slugger, not a boxer. People were, after they saw it, they said, Jesus, you just beat the crap out of those drums. I said, I'm playing rock and roll, man. <laughs> I'm 25 years old. I have a lot of adrenaline in me, and, you know, that's what happens. And uh, I only broke one or two cymbals in that show. Wow. It's pretty demanding, isn't it, to play drums like that? It's like a really huge gym workout. Yeah, it it is like a gym workout, uh, no question about it. The difference is you're you're using your entire body, your feet. You're you're sitting down, so you're using your feet, but you're not using them to run. You're using them to play. Bass drum here, hi hat over here, and then the, the, the upper cymbals, hi hats, and ride cymbals, and that sort of thing up here, and tom toms with your hands. And then as the drummer, you're carrying that beat. You, you, you're kind of that base level that's got to keep propelling everybody else forward, don't you? You can't just right. take a rest for a couple of minutes. Oh, there's no break. No, there's no break. There's just uh, the, the love of what what uh, what I do. Uh, I, I, uh, there's nothing like playing for an, an audience uh, that is definitely into what you're doing. Money can't buy that. Can you still play like that today? No. <laughs> Stu and I had a band, Creedence Clearwater Revisited, and we broke it up uh, two years ago. Played did that for 22 years, 25 years, excuse me. I could use my arms to a certain extent, but I found that the, the wrist, got, and then I brought the, the, the drums in a little closer to my body, so I, I wasn't reaching. And then using the technique of uh, the, the martial arts, I played fine for an old guy. You hear the work bell ring And I march you to the table You see the same old thing And I'll food up on the table And I'll fuck up in the pen But you better not complain, boy he got in trouble with the man. Let the midnight fashion shine a light on. Let the midnight fashion shine a light on me. Let the midnight fashion shine a light on me. Some old guy, Cosmo is still known as one of the world's best drummers. That track was Midnight Special from their 1970 performance at London's Albert Hall, when at the apex of their career. Stick around as Cosmo continues his story. This is a breath of fresh air with Sandy Kay. It's a beautiful day. Welcome back. We've heard how the Beatles broke up just four days before CCR performed at London's Albert Hall, making CCR the number one act in the world. And then it all disappeared. 
The band was at its peak, having scored 14 consecutive top 10 singles and five consecutive top 10 albums. What do you think the success of Creedence Clearwater Revival was due to? Because you guys didn't sound anything like what was going on at the time, did you? That's why. Uh, We were unique. And if you put your history hat on and went and go back to the beginning of rock and roll, that's pretty much what our bare bones attempt was was all about. But that's what we grew up playing when we were the Blue Velvets, you know, when Tom was making these demos. And I taught myself how to play drums from records that I would buy. I used my books as drums instead of pencils. And then a little brass light that had a twist neck. And I would play that. And my mom came in one night and said, are you doing your homework? And I said, yes, mom. She says, why aren't your pencils sharpened? She took you out. I don't want to poke my finger, but I was doing homework. Yeah, which proved very lucrative in the end, of course. She must have been very proud of you. That was her dream. On the other hand, my dad was the opposite. He hated the music and was a bit of a racist. Uh, and I was you know, buying black music. I only played them when he wasn't around. I didn't want him hearing it because uh, he had threatened to break them. Right. So the influences were black and, and from the South. In the lyrics, you were talking about bayous and boats and all sorts of things, although you'd never even been there, to the best of my knowledge. And of course, John was up there in his hillbilly type outfits fronting the band. What was that all about? That's what he feels comfortable wearing and on and off stage. Cosmo, the band broke up after three years of being at the top. Did that come as a shock to you when Tom walked away and said he doesn't want to do it anymore? It didn't come as a shock because he was treated very poorly. Tom used to be the singer, and he, when John started you know, getting that voice, he gentlemanly, uh, he's the older brother too, you know, and the run of the thing, gave the John the vocals and uh, other things, you know. John said, don't send, give me any writing material you're doing. He was just pushing Tom out, was he? He was taking over. Yeah, so I I would stand up for him. That put me in the doghouse, and I was in the doghouse a lot with, with John, but right is right and wrong is wrong. He had a sweet tenor, uh, not like John, and so he could have done La, La Bamba. We did a lot of cover songs. You know, he didn't have to write it. He was owed a, sh- a chance to sing, never got it. So that and other things... John was a brilliant talent, but a terrible manager. And that's what put us under. Yeah, that's what Stu told me too. And John drove you really hard also. I guess from that time, the relationship between John and Tom was completely strained. Yeah. We needed a professional manager, a guy that could bridge the gap between the brothers. That was very important. That would would have solved the the problem. But then to also have the business acumen could go in and and get us a contract for the number one band in the land, the one one that was fair and worthy of what we were doing. I can't imagine what possessed John to think that he could be all to everybody. He could play, he could write, he could sing, and he could handle all the business stuff as well. I think as Stu put it to me or agreed with what I'd suggested was that he was the ultimate control freak. The ultimate. A plus for his creative side, F minus for his business side. I mean, he he didn't know that he didn't own his songs, didn't understand the contracts, and uh, on and on and on, but that's behind us. Uh, Didn't you guys arc up and try and shape it differently or he was so in control there was nothing that you could do yeah that was that was pretty much it i wasn't afraid of him uh getting his face but it wasn't going to happen it wasn't going to going to change and the good news is you know we have this legacy of music the, the positive that came out of all of it far outweighs the crap and crap is crap and gold is gold
Clifford, we got to 1972 and Tom Fogarty had just left the band. What happens? The band just disintegrates, right? Well, pretty much. We we had an ultimatum from John. We should have seen it coming, but uh, he said, uh, you guys want to be more involved, so you do a third, you do a third, and I'll do a third of the song. I won't sing on your songs because I have a unique voice. These are word for word. We're saying, that's not what the fans want. We, that's not what we're asking for. And he says, well, you do it or we, we break up right now. So uh, we basically took the, and then he said, we, we made him do it. So, you know, there's it, 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 a lot of negative there. And I don't want to get too carried away on the negative. It's, just, it's a new day and, and uh, you know. Yeah. The long and short of it is, though, that 50-something years later, you still don't speak to John Fogarty, do you? No, unfortunately, I have no problem with it. You have to talk to him through his lawyers, and that makes for pretty expensive love letters and not much romance. you go on to do then afterwards? Well, Stu and I had a production company uh, because we had the lease on this, the old factory, so might as well use it. And uh, we built a, a remote recording vehicle. And uh, uh, the idea would be that we'd rent the, the truck out and then we'd find bands that we, we want to develop and, and record. So we did that for about four years. And did you have the rights to keep playing Credence music when you and Stu became Credence Clearwater Revisited? Anybody can play this music. And you just have to pay a fee for it. It was never a matter of could we play the songs. It was a matter of could we use the name. Which you couldn't as it happened. Well, uh, as it happened, we, we did, and we could have called it Creedence Clearwater Revival, but John wasn't in it. We didn't want to try and pull the wool over anybody's eyes, especially our fans, so we called it Creedence Clearwater Revisited. What a John wasn't out there doing Credence songs at the time anyway, was he? He'd gone off to do his own solo stuff. Yeah, he, he wasn't on doing any of it. In fact, he refused to do it. And when we did it, he sued us and we ended up you know, winning. Uh, but uh, the whole thing was so silly. It was just a lot of money spent. He didn't get what he wanted. We got what we wanted, but it's hard to say there's a winner and a loser in this. Yeah. Well, I guess the fans were the big winners because they were still hearing the music. Well, there you go. The fans would have hoped that you would all come together and put your differences behind you and do one last appearance. But, of course, when Tom Fogarty died in 1990, that put an end to that dream, didn't it? It sure did, yeah. And I I miss him. He was a a sweetheart of a guy and he got the short end of the stick. And if you look at history, bands with brothers in them always end up on the rocks. The people wanted it. I would hear it every day. Why don't you guys you know, get together and play live? We'll get some of us together, and, and that's what we did. We wouldn't uh, have lasted 25 years if, if we weren't doing something right. So, Doug, if you'd had your time again, what would have you done differently? 
First of all, uh, you get a, 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 an entertainment lawyer slash experience manager. That's that's what I would do. I also have this guy mend the fences of Tom and John. Yeah. Doug, we've talked about the rockumentary travel and band Credence Clearwater Revival at Albert Hall, and I'd encourage everybody to go and have a look at that because you just relive the days. But there's also a sensational book out about the band. It's called A Song for Everyone, the story of Credence Clearwater Revival. What are your thoughts on the book? I think it's the best one so far for the band, you know, not focusing on the negative so much. You know, we we were very prolific, dedicated to uh, the project, no matter what was going on, bubbling underneath. Uh, we lived up to our expectations and then some. So it's Shakespearean, if you will. <laughs> the documentary actually shows the first Credence concert video that's ever been officially released. And at the end of it, the fans are all up on their feet, clapping and demanding an encore for about 15 minutes. It's not that you didn't want to give them one. What happened there? Well, it was a rule that John had made some time before that. He said, encores are phony and we'll never do another one. One of those weird things. And uh, we never did one. I, want, I was tempted to run out. But it would have just been a calamity. Somebody might have gotten hurt. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, there's some of the uh, idiosyncrasies. John is a shy person in a lot of ways. And uh, when he's singing, he's on the microphone facing the audience. When he's not singing, he turns away from the microphone. I didn't notice that before. Check it out. Doug, I won't hold you up very much longer, but you started off telling me that you had a whole lot of music in Cosmo's vault. Are we likely to see more from you, Doug, as time goes on? As time goes on, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Right now I have to put my focus on California Gold. That's what's on the table right now, so I want to make sure everybody gets a drumstick. Uh, Every pun intended there. (laughs) What's your all-time favourite Credence song? Which one did you enjoy playing the most? It's the one I enjoy listening to the most and and then playing uh, second. Born on the Bayou. It's a power quarter note beat. The same one I used on Susie Q, but a different foot pattern. It leaves the the notes very open, so the guitars have almost like a, a natural reverb. It's a pretty catchy thing, and it also makes it pretty hard not to tap your foot or jump in the middle of the dance floor. Yeah, isn't that the truth? We'll have a listen to that one now. Doug Clifford, thank you so much for being generous with your time. And uh, we'll let everybody know that they've got to go out and buy California gold right now. Thanks, Andy. Doug Cosmo Clifford there, who was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1993. I hope you've enjoyed our chat and make sure you check out the podcast if you'd like to catch up with some of my back episodes. Thanks again for your company today. I'll look forward to being back with you again same time next week. Bye now. Because it's a beautiful day. Mm-hmm. You've been listening to A Breath of Fresh Air with Sandy Kay. Beautiful day. It's a beautiful day